as uh, I started to tip the balance as soon as I <laughs> uh, sat down. And uh, this is um, a very exciting moment for me. And I must say, uh, one of the, uh, the important um, work that's done for the project West Heavens uh, in the last few years, in fact, uh, in very many years, is this massive undertaking of these six anthologies. Um, we, were we have been friends for over 10 years. Uh, this West Heavens project uh, is, a, is a project that aims to bring uh, China, India together culturally uh, with art and with um, uh, intellectual endeavors. Um, and it started as part of the um, Guangzhou, uh, no, the Shanghai Biennial in 2010 in Shanghai, uh, for which there was a big art uh, exhibition, a collaboration between Indian and Chinese artists. And for the first time in decades, uh, there was a major um, sim a series of talks by significant uh, Indian scholars um, in the public realm. Um, they were giving, they gave lectures in the Museum of Shanghai, and uh, Chinese scholars were invited to have a discussion with them. And there was a small volume published by each of them. And uh, uh, in this company, uh, Tejaswini Niranjana, um, wife of Ashish, she was one of the um, the uh, seven scholars who came to China for the Shanghai Biennial, um, and uh, and the the year after, uh, 2011. Uh, Ashish organized a, a major project for, for China, which is Indian cinema. So for that, um, for, for this introduction to China of Indian uh, contemporary culture, um, there has been many uh, significant repercussions, uh, including the invitation of a Rex Miller Collective to be in charge of the Shanghai Biennial in 2016. So uh, once again, um, uh, the um, West Heavens project, with the help of scholars like Ashish, has come back to the, to, to the Chinese soil. And this time, we are uh, we are very uh, grateful uh, to our collaborators who have published uh, the Chinese version of the first volume of the series. And uh, Enoch Enoch Tam, who is the publisher and also chief editor, he is. He is coming now, but he had just finished the class, so um, so he'll be introduced when he arrives. And uh, uh, just another word about West Heaven's project. Um, this, for me, must have been one of the most exciting um, intellectual adventure uh, in the last op last 15 years, as it opens to me a world of uh, exciting ideas and the and also to some of the um, um, uh, sh sharpest intellectual uh, acumen that one can find, um, especially in dealing with problems of modernity with the modern world. And uh, this is not just um, a problem for, uh, for India or China, but it is actually now a more acute uh, issue today with change in global politics and especially with the, the co co uh, post-COVID era. So uh, I've been dragging on and on to, uh, just to express my gratitude to, uh, to Ashish and to the scholars who have come to have a conversation with him. Um, so I'll leave this to the moderator. Uh, sorry, I forgot to thank Asia Society. I mean, Asia Society has actually been absolutely heroic because uh, um, they manage all this in a very short time, really efficiently. Um, and, uh, and also, this is uh, one of the most comfortable uh, situation I can imagine, having a talk right in central Hong Kong. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anjali Gunaratna, and I am an assistant professor of English at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I will be your moderator for this evening, and my first task is to introduce our panelists. So right next to me is, uh, is Ashish uh, Raja Diaksha, um, the editor of The Hunger of the Republic, uh, present in retrospect. 
and Ashish is an independent film studies and cultural theorist based in Bangalore. Um, next, we have Alistair McClure, who is a historian of South Asia and the British Empire, um, also based at the University of Hong Kong. Um, and Brian Sui, uh, who is a historian at the Department of Chinese Culture at Hong Kong Polytechnic University and the author of China's Conservative Revolution, The Quest for a New Order, um, and co-editor with Pan Sen Sen of Beyond Pan-Asianism, Connecting China and India, 1840s to the ni 1960s. Uh, Enoch Tam, the editor-in-chief uh, of a type such as publishing, is not here as yet, so I think uh, he was going to uh, speak first, but um, I will turn things over to you, Ashish. And I think there is a, um, a presentation as well. Okay. Um, uh, one second. Um, so thank you very much, uh, first of all, Asia Society, for having us all here. Um, there are a lot of people to thank. Um, I mean, Johnson, um, really thank you, Johnson, over the years. Actually, now over the decades, one should say, uh, the mm -hmm. kind of support that you have extended has made a lot of difference uh, in India, leave alone, you know, the larger, larger uh, conceptual frames within which uh, um, West Heavens works. Um, uh, Enoch Tam um, of Typesetter Press uh, has brought this particular, really very dense book in Chinese now, and we shall now see what the future of this book is going to be in in the Chinese-speaking world. It's going to be quite a quite an interesting journey that the book will hopefully have. Um, I want to thank Tulika Books in Delhi, um, who partnered West Heavens to bring this series out. Um, I want to specifically thank Chen Yun um, of West Heavens, who, who is Shanghai based, uh, who is unfortunately not able to be with us today, without whom this project would have simply not been possible. Um, and the authors, the artists, the, the numerous people who have been associated with this particular volume who let us use their, their work. Um, I just want to very quickly introduce the, the series. Um, one Sorry. The three volumes that have actually come out so far um, are, uh, the second one is actually on performance uh, and the body. Um, the third is about the moving image after video. Uh, and the fourth, which is just now happening, is on urban, the urban spaces, uh, on urbanization in, in, in India. It's called Cities Untold. Um, two additional volumes. One is about the museum in India after, uh, in a way, in, in more recent times, as the museums have started taking on more and more complex and contentious uh, political issues um, in, 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 in India. And uh, there was going to be one more on still photography. It's called uh, by Rahab Allana. He's editing this. Now, I am the overall series editor of the series and uh, uh, also the editor of the first volume. The sec all the other volumes are edited by different people. Uh, and it is the first volume which has now been made available in China. It's called The Hunger of the Republic. Uh, I just want to say a couple of prefatory things around books and translated books uh, as, I, as I start. Um, you know, there's something very robust about publishing a book, uh, you know, as against making a film or doing a painting. A book exists in the public domain in a rather robust fashion, and notwithstanding uh, Enoch's here. Um, Enoch, join us. Um, books exist in a robust fashion. I mean, we have had histories of books being burned, books being banned, uh, and yet books have a longevity, a, a capacity to survive. Uh, mainly, it seems to me because as objects, there is a certain resilience that books have. Uh, and, and, and we do rely on them to, to hold their own in the face of multiple historical challenges in a way that other, other art objects aren't necessarily able to do. Um, and now we have a book which has been intended as a certain kind of object placed in the public domain that is now being put in translation as another book by, by Typesetter Press. Um, and, and we now look to see what the career of this particular book is going to be because this is not to be, to be predicted. Whatever it is, whatever journey it takes, it is going to be a journey of a certain ongoing act of meaning making and, and translation of which this book itself, I think, has been a part. 
um, the essential um, feature of such survival is in the circulation of books. You know, books circulate. Uh, and I think circulation of books has become in itself a meaning-making activity that, I th that we must now want to spend a bit of time about. Uh, this is a series that's ostensibly about India, but it is also a s about a something more abstract. I mean, India not as a place or a region, but India as more a concept, and that's something I think West Heavens has been very interested in. Uh, India as method, you might say, to modify our old friend Quan Ching Chen's uh, words, allows us to revisit not only a place named India, but also to revisit concepts that India has ostensibly stood for, such as democracy, politics, cultural history, and increasingly totalitarianism. As we focus then on the circulation of the book, the, the ability of the book to move, uh, we also discover what seems to be a new capacity that we all collectively have, and not only in India, but everywhere, to read uncanny significances into the familiar, which is a strategy that typically exists under totalitarian conditions when you read things in ways not intended. You read things, you, you misread, there's a misrecognizance, as they say, a misrecognition. Thereby reinvigorating many of our received systems of interpretation and meaning making, Meaning emerging here now, not only through returns to the past, but I think, I mean, this has been the strategy of the series, through three kinds of interpretative journeys. One, from present to past, necessarily as we return to history. A second is from past to future. And I think I'd like to sort of spend a bit of time thinking about what that, that is you know, when you move from past to future. And a third, purely in the present, in the way the texts circulate horizontally from hand to hand in the immediate present. As all these vectors combined into one hallucinatory sort of amalgam of hindsight and retrofuturism, they reveal a consciousness that we, the readers, viewers, appear to share with people who made these works, quite recently wrote these texts, printed photographs, for reasons uh, far removed in time and place from the ones that we are currently bringing to them. A kind of a textual solidarity, you might say, with people who wrote these texts at different times through a process of re-presentation and re-circulation as if pre-designed to address future historical uncertainty, even as that uncertainty generated unexpected creative and analytic opportunity. Now, this is, I think, very important because we're looking at a time that is historically not too far away. It's the 90s, India since the 90s, and yet in a strange since it might well have been 100 of 150 years ago. There is a hiatus in a way that has separated what happened quite recently from what's happening now. Uh, there's a technological hiatus to do with digitization, but there might be other kinds of gaps that, has ha that have happened that, have, that require us to stay at a distance from, from a time that we have experienced, but we haven't theorized enough in a way. Uh, so what really happened, I think, was this in this particular series, we began setting up encounters with what one would describe as the ghostly remnants of concepts, such as democracy, such as the will of the people, as though you might encounter ruins of a time as it once purportedly was. You know, These are concepts that may have existed in a certain way, and we're actually encountering an afterlife of those concepts in the, in, in the present. A ceaseless movement, the, total, the totalizing new normal, through new light on the constitutive role of normalcy. I mean, what is the normal? What is the everyday? The everyday experience? Is it a cover-up? Is there something else happening beneath normalcy? This redefined new normal, a phrase that you use all the time, uh, takes us, this book series argues, back to other moments that had similarly encountered this unprecedented everyday. This was not a return to origins, not a return to how things once were. Rather, it was a discovery in such moments of the ghosts of other moments, right? So for example, today, however things pan out, you cannot really speak of the, of the today without speaking of globalization. Uh, and you can't speak about globalization without, for example, looking at what happened in the 1970s in India in, uh, in the post-emergency period and so forth. So that even immediate questions took us back in times when the Indian state was imagined and reimagined politically and administratively. Now, this is a kind of a methodology that I think may find resonance in 
other locations that may not be terribly interested in or familiar with what happened in India, but might actually see this India as method kind of approach to be a kind of a met metaphorical detour to speak of things that are not necessarily only to do with India. Um, I'll just show you some. Sorry. Oh, keep going back. This is uh, the texts um, that we have in English, and I think that the Chinese edition has substantially stayed with them. I mean, some of them are extremely famous texts. I mean, Rajni Kothari's Democracy in Search of a Theory in 2005, the, the great, the grand man figure of Indian social sciences who passed away his last book, Sudhipta Kaviraj is the Imaginary Institution of India, Gyanendra Pandey's In Defense of the Fragment, uh, Utsa Patnaik's The Republic of Hunger. Now these are really famous essays from social sciences in India, but along with them we have a number of texts that are not that well known. Uh, we've actually tried to create what one constantly calls as a kind of mashup. Um, let me move on. These are a set of visual installations that we did. Uh, so Rajini Kothari's last book was, uh, it's called uh, In Search of, what, no, Democracy in Search of a Theory. You know, he's actually trying to figure out what democracy might possibly mean as a concept in 2005. I mean, this is the man who wrote politics in India in 1962. And you know, I mean, this is, this is his last book before, before he died. And what we've done is we've created a series of, uh, of montages uh, on, on in, a, in, a, in a sync master computer of key events that have defined India in the decade. You know, this is the destruction of the Babri Masjid. This is the attack on the, on the, uh, the, the 2002. Um, at, um, going along with uh, Gyanendra Pandey's uh, famous essay uh, called In Defense of the Fragment, what Pandey does is he looks at a very important school textbook called Modern India. This is an eight standard class textbook written by the very eminent historian Bipin Chandra. And down below, he's actually got uh, a human rights report uh, of a massacre that took place in a place called Bhagalpur in 1989. And he tries to understand how such an event as what happened in Bhagalpur in 89 can redefine Indian history, in what way that incident actually challenges this particular kind of history writing. Here we have, 25 years later, a really important photographer, Javed, uh, Javed um, with Ismail, who actually returns Gram Logayan to the locations where the original events had happened in 1989, as though you know the remnants of those. those these are the visuals that go along with uh, Pandey's uh, essay, um, along with Geeta Kapoor's very famous essay on contemporary cultural practices. This is uh, actually a Shanghai uh, Biennale installation, Moinak Bishwar of the filmmaker Ritwik Ghatak. Um, now, uh, Ritwik Ghatak was a really important filmmaker in the 70s, and he has become, in this book, a meme. He has become a kind of a figure. So uh, I'll just go to the back to the cover of the book. Uh, you know, you're actually getting a kind of a situation. Uh, the, the, the film, his last film, Reason, Debate, and a Story, ends with him playing himself, being shot, and, and falling down as he is caught in crossfire between radical activists and the police. And he and this falling figure of Ghatak is actually the figure now um, that we get sort of as it were hovering over the incidents that have defined modern India. So Ghatak has become a meme in this particular in this particular story. Uh, and here he is. Um, I want to move on a little bit. This is a text that y you image that you were uh, very interested in. Um, Kancha Ailaya uh, writes about death, and he writes about the the, the distinction between a, a kind of a upper caste Hindu definition of death and and what happens when people die and what happens to the afterlife of people who die versus a Dalit that is a low caste conception of death itself, right? Uh, it's a very important essay. It's called Hindu Death and Our Death. And accompanying this is this particular masterwork by K.P. Reji, the Thumbigal Chartan, or the spirit of Thumbigal, which is about Dalit survival or living on between mythic memory and historical time, between death and life and the afterlife. Dalit kids with cutting tools dawdle around a habitat teeming with animal rife en route to festivities celebrating Gandhi's birth anniversary at school where they clean premises and overgrown grass. A ship floats by. This ship was originally the HMS Hermes, Herms, 
um, that, that, that had seen action during the Falklands takeover in 1982 when Margaret Thatcher had gone to war with the Argentinians, which then became INS Virat when the Indian state purchased it in 86. And finally in 2012, when Reji is making his painting, it's now in the dockyards of Kochi for its final patch up. Again, such a historical time is framed in undead past, the Bhutam, Green trees, bracket leafless branches streaming with crows, betokening spirits of martyred ancestor heroes, past noisy ducks as the legendary figure of the spirit of Thumbigal, a Dalit peasant believed to have been lynched for loving an upper caste woman, his corpse dumped in a paddy field, if you can see it here, uh, as a means to project a breached bund by sacrificing himself to save his community. The spirit of Thumigal confronts us in a specific mode with open eyes that lock with the viewer's gaze and in the reclining position reminiscent of the Buddha before attaining Nirvana, the brutalized Dalit corpse and evil troublesome spirit doubles up as a wise and divine guide for his community today. getting it to work, Kelvin. Can you move to the next one? Um, the clock on the left-hand side uh, from Escaped by the Rux Media Collective and data mugshot in the, in, in the center, uh, sorry, in the, in the same, sp uh, on the left, uh, you actually have the dead figure of the Dalit beneath them. Um, in the center, alongside a very famous essay by M. Madhav Prasad, uh, is uh, work by uh, by uh, Rux, uh, by by uh, uh, Riyas Komu, which actually uses the constitution of India around around citizenship, uh, and, and we actually continue to have that Dalit figure there. And on the right hand side, accompanying this famous short story by Jayant Kaikini that they just when he's translated, along with an Atul Dodia uh, work, uh, we we have once again. You can't see it very clearly, but you can see that the Dalit figure there as well. Next one, please. Sorry, I don't, there's something wrong. Um, Shuddha Brother Sengupta analyzes the highly mediatized legal evidence that followed the 13 December 2011 attack on parliament, in which armed terrorists entered the parliament house in a car with official stickers, got out and began shooting. Um, there were, you know, the, it's a very famous uh, legal case that happened um, involving. Um, some of the people, S.A.R. Gilani, a university lecturer who was then basically accused of having caused this. Sorry. Um, Sengupta shows how diverse fantasies of mediatized technology played a central role in the reconstruction of the event itself, as several films dealt both directly and indirectly with this incident and mobilized popular images of terrorists and the so-called mo modus operandi. You're getting a huge bunch of films that, that now have tell you these stories. <laughs> about terrorists and about the way that the Indian state kind of got after them, which is the popular imagination of terrorism, which <laughs> actually affected the legal case of this of this time. Um, on, on the, on the left-hand side, Sanjay Kak's famous documentary, Jashne Azadi, How We Celebrate Freedom, alongside the kitsch displays of military digital tech in the film 16 December, a lowbrow fictional reenactment of the 13 December attack. These are the images that go alongside that text by Sengupta. Um, and last, I'll conclude now. Um, heroic speech in such times can be leavened as conscious strategy by the unheroic. Um, can, can you go to the previous one? Uh, or go to the next one, please. Yeah. Um, this is actually a, 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 a sculptor called K.P. Krishnakumar who committed suicide sometime in the early 2000s. And this is a, a sculpture he made called The Thief. Um, and this, you know, the, he was part of the Indian Radical Painters and Sculptors Collective and his fascination with the radicalism figures who Anita Dubey, whose own manifesto statement for questions and dialogue uh, written in the, in the early 90s in Baroda um, is, has been reproduced in the, in the book. Um, and she talks about figures who are not the glorious figures of labor, but really edgy, naked, sexual, cunning proletarians like this particular thief. And what we've done here is that we've put that particular thief on top of uh, images by Veena Das of the Bhopal 
gas disaster. So this was in the late, uh, uh, early, 80, uh, mid early, mid eight, early to mid 80s, I think, I've forgotten the day, 84 maybe, when there was this, in this industrial disaster in the city of Bhopal, when uh, a factory, a uh, union carbide, actually th there was this deadly gas that killed many thousands of people. And she speaks at some length about this in the book, that is in the essay that has been reproduced in this particular book. So the thief is on top of an image of that Bhopal gas, gas factory. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I wanted to basically sort of indicate the kind of mashups that we have attempted as we have used images and texts that are well known that were produced in this time to, to, to come together to make a meaning that one, one hopes may be larger than the sum of their parts. And I now leave it to Enoch to explain to us how or if all of this has been trans, how it has come to be reborn as it were in, in its Chinese iteration. So thank you. Hello, hello. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ashish. Uh, sorry for missing the early part of your of your of your wonderful speech. And I, I'm Ian Tam, um, the editor in chief of the Pep Sector Publishing in Cantonese is So, um, uh, so I, I I would like to spend some time introduce my publishing publishing house, and then um, I will. We talk a, bit, a little bit about you know um, the, trans the, the the publishing process and also the translation process of this uh, volume. Uh, my publishing house actually established in uh, 2015, uh, and we brand in 2018. And, and after 2018, uh, we focus more on um, academic publishing. Um, so we we see you know a lot of gaps in Hong Kong. You know um, about uh, um, how to you know convey you know, knowledge outside the academia. So I, I understand that you know within the academia we have a lot of intellectual exchange you know uh, discussion, um, but uh, how all those you know um, knowledge expressions etc can be you know assessed by the general public. So you know the the main idea for me to establish. Um, the publishing house is, is to you know would like to you know use this as a mean to uh to 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 i don't know which word is a better word to to to, to describe but to convey or convert you know all those intellectual um exchange conversation within the academic acad media and through the you know the, the, pro the process of publishing that can be assessed by the general public uh we have um few focuses um, or few keywords uh, um, uh, of our direction. Uh, we probably spoke on, for example, gender studies, um, Hong Kong studies, and also critical theory. Um, our upcoming book, uh, let me to do a promotion <laughs> here, is translation of Judy Butler, uh, Picarious Life. So we've done the um, complex Chinese rendition of that book. I hope that it can be released uh, maybe in July or, or June. Uh, it, it depends on the progress. So we have a lot of ongoing project, you know, with uh, this direction. So you may be curious that why we would go to pu publish, you know, uh, this book because you know somehow this book, you know, uh, for of course within our direction, but somehow you know. Some some part of it actually uh, transcends what we have been done um, uh, in the past few years. So the first time when Ashley approached approached me, I think two three years ago, maybe yeah. Um, uh, he had a you know uh, ambition idea to publish the sixth volume of um, uh, this series um, in Chinese, and um, and he passed me all the materials of the first two volumes, and he's asked me to see if there is any readership in Hong Kong. And I, you know, frankly speaking, I very honestly will tell him that I don't think there is a huge readership in Hong Kong <laughs> about this. Um, we, you know, Hong Kong, you know, first of all, Hong Kong um, reader, you know, care much about, you know, um, East Asia more than the Southeast Asia or the South Asia. So, in Hong Kong, we publish book about you know Japan, Korea, Taiwan, or you know mainland Hong Kong relationship. Except for, for example, 
um, can attract more reader you know, than a book like this. But uh, after a second funding, this is very, um, um, a very, you know, uh, very uh, good way for us as a publisher to explore whether the possibility of you know expanding ourselves beyond, you know, um, the original scope. So I accept the challenge, and um, and uh, but sorry for for the delay <laughs> of publishing. So we plan to publish, you know, uh, uh, last year, but for many so many reasons, we will finally be able to publish the books this year. And um, of course, during the you know publishing process, we need to adjust a lot because you know originally it translated into um, simplified Chinese, and then we need to convert the simplif simplified Chinese into uh, the complex Chinese, what we have right now, and you, and I don't know how many of you understand the process. It's not only clicking a button, you know, convert from a simplified Chinese to uh, the traditional Chinese, but uh, uh, the use of word, the sentence structure, even the transliteration of names need to be changed because, you know, we understand about this. So we spend some time on this whole process. But um, what I as a uh, publisher and also um, 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 the editor of the Chinese tradition, uh, Ch Chinese rendition. When I read through the whole book, I'm really amazed about you know, you know, the, the this collection of axioms, um, because from my past experience, usually a collection of essays like this. I, I, I'm a confess, I'm not a, an expert of you know India, but just from you know a general reader perspective. I read a lot of you know that kind of anthology, theoretical anthology before uh, in my master degree, my PhD studies. Um, usually, you know, in a collection like this, you, you, you usually have you know, a, a, you know, usually have a, a, the, the, the essays are in similar nature. Is it good? Okay. Similar nature with um, very heavy, you know, philosophical or theoretical integration. Thank you. And uh, but sti in this imp uh, anthology, um, um, when I you know did uh, editing, I, I reviewed it. Um, uh, of course, part of it is very you know philosophical and theoretical, just like you mentioned. You know the, the famous um, essay in search of democracy, in search of a democracy in short of theory. But also, it includes some very sentimental stories and witnesses, first hand witnesses. Um, and those pieces really, you know, for me um, as a reader, which is not very familiar with, you know, the situation in India, uh, can, can at least capture, you know, the picture of what happened in the past long 20 years, maybe over a half decade. What happened in India? That how later people can, uh, you know, reconceptualize all all those things. Not only in theoretical terms and theories, but also in narrative, in fictional stories, um, in, in in news reports, um, in all the all, 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 all the uh, those evidence and witnesses we can read in this uh, uh, book. Um, and also, you know how this anthology actually can encompass um, a lot of things, so many things from you know popular culture, you know cassette, uh, the song from some cassette, all the way to you know um, the internet. You know how the internet can be or cannot be a public sphere, um, and all you know, and also extend to the issue of feminism and also uh, LGBT issue transgender issue, something like that. So I would say, you know, it is a very wonderful, really wonderful uh, collection um, uh, of essays. I, I enjoy reading it. Um, I don't have, you know, very, uh, maybe you two have more to say about, you know, can re uh, respond to um, um, the anthology. But as a, as a publisher, I would say uh, it is really my honor to publish this in Hong Kong. And of course, our reader, sheet, our, read, our reader is not limited in Hong Kong. You know, we have connection in, of course, uh, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. Um, hopefully, we can, you know, uh, 
ship some books to mainland China. I don't know how, but I, uh, hopefully we can do that. So thanks again for Archie to pass the book to me and let me you know, open my, my eye and my mind to this wonderful book. Hello. Okay. Um, thanks for that, and thank you for um, the talk so far. Um, so first, I'll start by just congratulating um, Ashish and everyone involved um, I in what is really a wonderful achievement. Um, I can only imagine the amount of thought and care and coordination that goes into producing the sort of project of this sort of size. So um, it's a, it's a fantastic achievement. And as my comments will suggest, um, I think what the final product represents is a really necessary and valuable contribution to any of us that have some interest in the many important questions that, that come out in across these texts um, will be really we are fascinated by. Um, so I'm gonna speak as if most people haven't read the book and, um, and kind of mention three things that really struck me about um, the texts that, 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 that are chosen, um, which I hope will give some sense of what I think the value of, of the anthology is um, and the significance of, of this type of work. Um, so the first thing I wanted to kind of note is the kind of value that this has as a learning and teaching resource. And so I know Ashish wants to talk about mashup, but as a historian, I, I couldn't help but think about it as, a, as an archive of a really, really um, rich and carefully curated interdisciplinary archive of texts that move across some of the most important themes of Indian politics then and of course now. Um, and this is thinkers, writers, academics, artists that are thinking about Indian political life in the 90s, um, later 80s, early 90s. Um, and so for all of us that you know, have read our critical approaches to archive, we know that everything is about deciding what goes in and what goes out. And I think um, what we see here is a really refreshing um, and diverse range of voices um, uh, and disciplinary perspectives on this 90s period. Um, and so there are essays on economics, political theory, history, historians writing, anthropologists writing, but also what I thought was really interesting is the interspersing of academic writings with you know, civil rights reports and translated stories, um, legal writings and so forth. Um, and so in bringing these together, what I felt uh, very strongly was that um, there's an essay that Pandey writes about that he says that you know, there's an important conversation that we should have between the political and the academic. And it was very clear to me, the reading the anthology, as you move through the text, that there is that conversation happening in the decisions that were made in the editorial process and the text themselves. Um, um, and so um, one of the things that really pulsates through all the texts is the kind of urgency, there's a political urgency to all the texts because often they're written about after some crucial and often tragic moment of India's, of India's kind of political journey um, and its post-colonial kind of um, moment. Um, and so there's a real urgency I found to all the texts um, in that sense. Um, and then as I want to just know, and I'm sure others will come back to it, um, alongside that I really appreciated there's a, I think a quite attempt to be very inclusive in the text. It's not written for people that necessarily need to know everything about India, even though we move across many texts, uh, many topics, many themes. So I really appreciated the kind of glossary at the end, the, the key words. Um, I think that's a very, very nice addition. And of course, and we'll come back to it, um, the decision to publish in Chinese and English, I think, is, is very, very valuable. Um, so in that sense, you know, my first thing to say was that for teachers and students of the region, then this is very valuable, but also for anyone that wants to kind of dip their feet in, I think, South Asian politics and culture, this is an excellent starting point. Um, so um, with that in mind, the second thing I, I wanted to mention was reading it now um, is the kind of the continued salience of, of, of these works, right? And um, the book is titled um, The Hunger of the Republic, Our Present in Retrospect. Um, and one of the things that she mentions in the instruction is this thing that's happening in the 90s around the, a new configuration around the people, uh, populist, populism, popular sovereignty, uh, and so forth, um, and how that is constantly cutting across all sorts of other tensions that have much longer legacies um, and have continued to have, um, have played out in, in very important ways in, in Indian politics in the last 30 years. Um, and so many of the themes in the book, uh, those are interested in things like questions of secularism and the rise of Hindutva, neoliberal economics and economic precarity, democracy, popular sovereignty, language, religion, caste, they're, they're all there in some form. Um, 
Um, but one of the things I found um, about reading it, that there was something very productive disorientating about reading a set of texts in the 90s, uh, which some of them you can read and there's almost a straight, you would know straight away that there's uh, the story has continued almost in this linear trajectory. And so I, as I was reading it this week, you know, some of the texts I was reading um, about secularism and parliamentary democracy and sovereignty, and I look on the TV, right, and there's the inauguration of the parliament with deeply religious symbolism happening, you know, consciously happening. And so you have this jarring sense, you read some of these texts and you think, you know, these things are, st are continued as you might have been predicting, right? Um, you know, I looked at Twitter and I see decisions about, um, there was the controversy around recently this week, right, about the, De about the Delhi um, University Council talking about maybe removing Muhammad Iqbal from the, and then you read here and you see about the long, the 90s discussing history and nationalism and memory and stuff and these sort of things. And so those things you just immediately see and you think, okay, I see the trajectory. But then others you read, I mean, I'm thinking about, the, there's an essay, a really lovely essay on by Ravi Sundaram on technology in this moment. And he's talking about the small amount of telephones that are there, internet connection, cyber culture. And then you think, wow, that is a long time. What he's talking about then, so now it's completely another world, right? And so, so there's this really interesting disorientating kind of relationship to some of the texts which feel like they've continued in a certain way and others that have kind of shot forward and back. And, and so I, I was kind of interested in, when you were thinking about these texts, were you thinking about how people now look back at what has changed and what has not changed and the different speeds of some of these stories? Um, so that was one thing that I really thought about, um, uh, about when you, because you know, one of the things I guess you had as an editor was the benefit of, of hindsight, right? And these authors didn't have that, right? They wrote in the 90s and now they're published in, in the book now. So I wondered how you thought about that benefit of hindsight and, and putting these authors together in that form. Um, and the final thing I'll, I'll note, I won't go for too long, is just the importance, I think, of, of doing this in Hong Kong uh, uh, right now. Um, and in, again, to return to it, the benefit of publishing in English and Chinese at the same time. And so um, I'm trained uh, as a historian in history of South Asia and South Asian studies more broadly. And I think the discipline, or as area studies is what we want to call it, is a very long and established set of networks between Europe and North America and South Asia. Institution, institutional networks, publishing networks, um, cultural exchange, and these sort of things. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things in South Asia in the last 10 years has been the expansion into places like Singapore, South Africa, the Middle East, which has pushed the discipline to thinking about how we build those connections well beyond Europe and South Asia, America, South Asia. Um, and I think that's why we're starting to talk about things like Afro-Asian connections or Indian Ocean studies and these sort of things, because there are those, th those new networks. But that takes labor, right? It takes work, it takes translation, it takes thinking about how to understand how those different traditions, uh, intellectual traditions, political traditions, and those places have built over time. And I think in that context, this sort of work is absolutely necessary, right? It's, a bu it's bridge building between places. And Hong Kong and India, I think, have a lot of very interesting connections and differences, which we need to, you know, teaching here for the last four years has demonstrated that, I think. And so I think, I hope that this sort of work, as we move forward, will help people who have those interests in South Asia and connections between Hong Kong and South Asia um, work through what are some of the most important essays in, in, in India at that time. And so I think in that sense, Again, once again, I can say it's a, it's a really wonderful achievement. I thoroughly enjoyed reading some essays that I haven't read for 10 years, some I d hadn't heard about, um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic contribution. So, um, yeah, congratulations to everyone involved. Hello. So, um, I'm... Brian Choi from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. I just wanted to perhaps echo what Ian Ocrosvin was saying that uh, that that when I was growing up, uh, South Asia does not really register very much in my consciousness. Even the content when I was when I started as an undergraduate uh, student, so there's two colleagues from my uh, HKU, uh, and there's very few. S South Asian content in uh, over the syllabus, so over the uh, curriculum in the Faculty of Arts, at least. Uh, even though I, I must say that South Asia is never too far from us in terms of concept, or even if you go to the comparative literature department and study post-colonial study, post-colonialism and subordinate studies, then these authors are always there. Although you don't actually know a bit a lot of about the contents, which is quite interesting. You keep you really talk. I mean, the I India is, is method right there for you. I mean, but then we only know India as method per se, rather than India as a living reality. And um, I'm glad, really, that that there's now more of uh, this uh, interest in 
in South Asia uh, across uh, across the curriculum. I'm not. Uh, I look forward to learning from uh, Anjali and uh, Alexa as to how your the students react react to that, and um, and also even even just throw back to when I was uh, uh, in high school, when this first steps to decolonize the curriculum, when English literature was renamed literature in English. The first novel that students had to read then was Aranda T. Royce's The God of North Small Things. It was a alongside Shakespeare, of course. So then you have this taste of, uh, of South, Sh South Asia right there for even in late, in late 90s. So this is just my, um, so, if, so, if, so if you would indulge me in sort of, sort of re remembering my time back as an undergraduate as, as HKU. But the, the, the main concept I wanted to uh, go back to um, is the, 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 the which Enoch in, in his introduction also stresses and also in Ashi's introduction is the concept of the, of the people. Right? Um, I mean, Ashi is in his introduction right very elegantly that under the new order in the, in the 90s, um, the, um, people no longer receive welfare as citizens, universal welfare as citizens, but as lead needy beneficiaries, beneficiaries and victims, right? Um, that that, that, that there were all these sort of narrative devices, uh, biomedical, legal, and caste ethic uh, of types, that served to pigeonhole various groups, discipline them, strike them of agency and perpetuate the well-tried strategy of divide and rule that goes back to the colonial era, right? Um, and it is obviously quite easier for us. I mean, Alistair mentioned that. I mean, there's this whole sense of deja vu. There's this benefit of hindsight. Well, it, it speaks to our present moment. And it's very easier for us to think of this moment as an aberration. Right, especially in India, you have BJP and, and Modi and the inauguration of the parliament and so on. It's so blatantly obvious that you forget that this moment has been going on and on and on for since the 90s and even before. Right? And a lot of the critiques that were being launched within the chapters were mostly directed at the, the nation's elite that were governing, was governing India since its independence with technologies and methods that they learned or inherited from the British. I mean, as a historian, I, I know that, you know, those, you know, for example, the in intelligence services in India, um, in post-independence post India, the, the, the of officers and so on, they were, they were, they were there before before decolonization. I mean, the same, the same officers, they wrote the same reports, and they, they, they had the same surveillance strategy, technologies. So these things, this whole idea of statecraft uh, was something that dragged on even before the 90s, even though the 90s, you have a new just confluence of forces and powers. Now uh, that I, th I think that that's why the, 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 the subtitle of this of this uh, of this volume, our present in retrospect, is most fitting. Uh, not only when we look at uh, 2013, 1993, or even back way back in 1953 or 1943, and so on. Now now um, let's uh, since the works of heavens project aims to uh, compare the different paths uh, that uh, modernity taken by India and China allowed me to throw this out about the concept of the people. Um, the, con the term people in, 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 in Chinese, Renmin, uh, Yanman, is a core concept in Chinese and in particular revolutionary political discourse. From the late 19th century uh, on, the term uh, congregation, Huan uh, or Chun, um, and then you have the in the 20th century the idea of the citizenry, Chinese citizenry, Guomin, Guoman, 
And then, of course, in after 1949, you have people uh, running, which, of course, is now featured in the title of the state that governs Hong Kong. All these terms, at some point in history, denote activists or even insurrectionist blocks that strive for social and political transformation, although a lot of the meanings have been lost over the years. Um, well, when you think of terms like Guomin or people or Renmin, you don't think of these as particularly revolutionary these days, and these are, of course, uh, of various reasons. Now, if you remember during the first wave of the COVID pan pandemic, um, uh, a scholar that's rather close to the West Heaven project, I suppose Wang Hui, uh, a, this uh, is a very sort of important leftist intellectual base in Tsinghua. Um, he wrote this rather strange piece on Lenin. But then there's this paragraph sort of tucked inside where he attributes the success of Wuhan in suppressing the pandemic to the uh, concept of people's war. The I mean, the uh, he, what he was trying to suggest is that the Chinese Communist Party is able to overcome bureaucratic inertia tap into the people's voluntary instinct and quickly mobilize the populace to fight against a common enemy, which in the case of the early 2020s was, of course, the corona COVID pandemic. Now, this argument was, of course, very controversial. Um, and obviously, as we read on the news um, across time, Many Chinese people did not experience strategy as such. They felt they saw such strategy in terms of massive surveillance um, with the help of advanced digital technology, um, arbitrary intrusion into private life, and simply bureaucratic overreach. Now, indeed, one can't help, I mean, I can't help, reading Yina Das's discussion of the Bopa gas leak disaster and not think of how China and other states deal with COVID and categorize citizens into worthy or unworthy beneficiaries of state benefits. Now, there is another Chinese term denoting the populace that is of a very different meaning and history than people or Yanman Renmin. I mean Lao Bai Xing, Lou Bak Xing, which is usually can be rendered into English as common folk or the rank and file. Or there's an even more straightforward term the common people, those people who are, do not belong either to the gentry or to the royal house, right? And, and I'm sorry, I, I just, sorry, sorry. I, 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 so, so, so every now and then when Chinese officials want to sound folksy, they would use Lao Ba Xing to refer to Chinese citizens. The implication being that these citizens are not interested in politics, but are more interested in being passive recipients of state benefits, developmentalist benefits in terms of you know, housing, education, uh, and so on. So um, I, I, I just wanted to perhaps ask Ashi, as you com put together this book and have it, you want to translate it to English, you start in the Chinese. You are, I suppose, speaking to a universal moment, moment right now that is increasingly getting more unfortunate and troubling. Uh, Sophia, sorry, thank you. So we will move on to the mo moderated panel discussion now. So I think 
to begin, uh, I would like to invite Ashish to respond to uh, some of the comments. I saw you taking many notes to some of the comments <laughs> made and maybe to expand on um, the things that both Alistair and uh, Brian were uh, um, noting in their individual reading of the text. Yeah, yeah, it works. Sorry, sorry. Uh, thanks. This is neat. Um, no, so thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, you know, I, I, I thank Enoch in his absence, and I'm going to now thank him in his presence for having made this happen. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, j just to return to this idea of the book and the fact that the book as an object, uh, and now the translated book as another object exists, is in itself something, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's there. It's undubitably, you know, that is not a matter of dispute or debate. It, it exists. Um, I have also been very interested then in careers of books um, in the context of how they, how they will exist and circulate with readers. So for example, we've talked about things like print on demand as a technology that actually can transcend borders, you know? So it is possible, for example, as your book the your edition is available in mainland China that you will use technologies that have a certain portability you know that will allow the book to 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 cir to, to to circulate in, in interesting ways and what then this circulation or new strategies of circulation and new strategies of reading say to the content or how the content is put together and, and assembled I mean we are actually at a new career of the book in a way, and I'm, I'm very interested in placing the translation question in this, at this moment, rather than within the kind of classical definitions, if you like, of translation from one culture to another. This is very much within the West Heavens spirit. I mean, you know, the idea of West Heavens really was to find these, these new spaces for conversation and exchange, and that is something that I think this particular series may make happen. Uh, two things, one is uh, I wanted to say that uh, we wanted very much not to introduce India to a Chinese audience. You know, it was as though we knew what we were doing and we were now going to tell you. Uh, there is something, I think, about the kind of generosity that Johnson has made available for Indians to really preen and say, well, we are the theorists, right? We know, you know, I mean, we have our problems, but we really do theory in a way. I, you know, we are the kind of non-Western West. <laughs> you know, we can produce canonical theoretical texts in a way, uh, and in English, uh, in a way that probably is almost unprecedented outside the Euro-American context. Now, of course, this is not so, and it's much more controversial than that. And I did want to make sure that in the process, for this whole series, in the process of putting the series together, that we did not talk down to an audience that wasn't ours. right? We had to recognize the fact that these are contentious arguments as much in India as anywhere else, and to, uh, to try and find a way that we really would work with uh, you know, complex concepts. Now, in doing this, I wanted to say something about the, about the keywords you know, at uh, there the end. Now, those keywords constantly take the process of trying to explain what does uh, an Indian word like Adivasi or Zamindar mean outside India. But we wanted to say that the word politics itself means something quite different, or the word people itself means something quite different from what the dictionary definition has meant. You know, for example, uh, you know, Rajni Kothari, uh, the democracy in search of a theory guy, wrote the canonical book on social sciences in India in 1964 or 67. I don't know if anyone remembers this. It's called Politics in India. You know, this was uh, Orient Black Swan, at, uh, Longman at that time that published this book. And he defines politics quite differently from how the Oxford English Dictionary would. For example, he will, the idea, we will use this very often that X is a political person and Y is not a political person. It's a very standard term that we will use in India. Or you'll often say that bringing people into the political process, you know, uh, that, you know, whatever the demand is, you have to bring it into the political process to make it happen. You know, uh, there would be other kind of inflections about, pol for example, one thing that was said very much was that, you know, after the late 1990s, Especially, I think, the digital turn, which is when you have this term beneficiaries, 
you know, which is a very new term. I mean, it's used, for example, in uh, when the digital delivery of benefit, you know, is that you will actually convert a citizen into a beneficiary, and you will have a very different technology, technology which is often known as the last mile problem, and so on. When you actually, you know, direct cash transfers, you know, very often the kind of the the centrally sponsored schemes that we have, like for example, the rural employment guarantee scheme, and so on, actually do have an entirely different way of defining who the beneficiary is. You know, which is which is not a terminal term that we would you have used in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, right? This particular kind of shift would be seen as a shift of people who are not in politics. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it, it's a it's it's a term that is very often used. I mean, you know, you go to CSDS, which is where the term actually, you know, I mean, they they would constantly speak about politics in ways that aren't that isn't how you would normally understand it. And then you realize that although we write in the English language in India, we do not write in the way that the West usually does. So, you know, we will use words that are quite, quite surprisingly, quite surprisingly different. Um, I mean, I'm just using politics as an obvious example and the people as absolutely another, another obvious example. So we had to really now find a way of exploring these concepts which were as strange or as new to Indian audiences as they were to anyone else, and then see if there was any methodological challenge that might be adopted by readers who are not familiar with and may not even be terribly interested in India, but will see this methodological question as something that they can use or they might find of interest, which is, I mean, I'm really sort of so pleased that so many of these things have been picked up by the by all of you, by the present panelists, because it's the first time I'm having an opportunity to talk about these concepts outside of those who are in the know, uh, as, as it were. Um, just one or two more things very quickly. Um, thanks, Brian, for bringing in the state question, because uh, it does seem to me that the over, I mean, what have also happens in India, again, politically, is this kind of overdetermined thing about you know electoral politics when you will say X government or Y government or whatever, you know, that somehow or the other, um, the entire political process is written in particular individuals who are seen as the actors on this particular stage. Uh, and that if you change individual X with individual Y, somehow everything will be solved. <laughs> you know, it'll all, every, you know, it'll all be okay. Now I'm not saying that that's unimportant, but I do think that we do need to theorize the state in ways that are rather more long durée, um, and, and, and I think that very often actually lots of people have been speaking about and, uh, you know, uh, but the, the, the manner in which a certain kind of colonial structure actually has become a point of reference. Um, you know, so I have, uh, when, uh, in fact, that, that brings me to Hong Kong. I mean, I was in, as, as friends will know, we were in Hong Kong in 2000 and, uh, and, and, and 19, which is when the protests happened, and I wrote this long essay called The Great Transition, where I did try to make uh, an argument around how several of the issues that seem to be, I mean, uh, that, that, that we seem to be talking about did have, uh, did have a, a history that really went back a long way, you know? Um, you know, I mean, it did involve certain kinds of legacies that we uh, had to had to had to battle with, and then two things happened, which is I think very important. One is that this idea of estrangement. You know, when you are looking at something, you know, Akbar Abbas talks about this. You know, when you're looking at something that you think you know, and then you go through it and you say, actually, I don't know it. I, you know, I thought I knew this essay, and then you look at it and say, wow, you know, it's doing something or the other. Uh, that I did not think it was doing. Um, and it could be, you know, an essay written as recently as 20 years ago, and it could be a famous essay, and you suddenly say, hell, I mean, it's actually doing this work. Or here is a phot photograph that's actually doing this, which you did not think it was. So absolutely, I think this is hindsight is pivotal. I mean, I think, that I think that one of the great strengths that we all collectively have is the ability of hindsight. But the hindsight, has a double-edged sword because what now happens is that the confusions and, and, and unclarities of history suddenly disappear and it is as though we're looking at history through like a 2020 vision, you know. Everything is suddenly absolutely clear in a way that it simply wasn't until, until quite recently. So the muddied histories that we have have now been, so to say, clarified. The dust has, so to say, settled, which is in itself a methodological challenge as well as a kind of, what you might say, a kind of a, uh, an elusive sort of dimension to, to, to sort of go through. 
And I think that's, that's a really interesting challenge in itself. So <coughs> conscious estrangement and conscious restaging of the familiar on grounds that are not those, that are not that familiar, you know? So, I mean, one thing that we did, which is actually terribly important for me, was that we took classic and famous essays in India and re-edited them. We actually created abridged versions. We did editorial interventions. Sometimes the authors were actively supportive, saying, you know, Sudhito Kavirat said, look, the imaginary institution of India has been published in 50 anthologies and a and hundred other textbooks. So just feel free to do whatever you're doing, because if anyone wants the original text, it's very much in print. You know, what we are doing with it is, of course, new. Others did not respond because they probably didn't like it but didn't want to say so. And one has hugely relied on the generosity and goodwill of uh, very eminent writers, artists, photographers, filmmakers whose images we've used, that the kind of mashups that we have tried to do, they have gone along with because they are interested in this idea of estrangement of what we are trying to do with this. And I think that the kind of methodological, methodological consequences of this may well be what the series will try and do. And I, I'm hoping, I mean, friends here can tell me that that will be what may well be the contribution of the typesetter editions uh, as uh, going forward, something like that. Um, since we, you ended on the question of method, uh, I mean, at least for me reading this, I'm not a historian, I'm a literature person. So I think for reading, think, thinking about how you mm -hmm. were consciously um, rethinking how narrative shapes itself, how we create you know, methods of, of narrating stories. Um, and with this book, you have to read both discursively and non-discursively because there are the essays, but then there are the images that you have to kind of read in between the essays on top of the essays. You know, say they're superimposed, they're so, you know, so. And I think Alistair, um, said that there was a disorienting experience, but also you were thinking not just of narrative form, but of narrative speed. And then there was the c there's the question of translation um, that, Brian, you brought up, and I'm wondering if that is something that you, you know, talk thought about when you were thinking of this text existing in Chinese. So I'm wondering if the panelists could pick up on that uh, question of method and e expand on, um, you know, what it what what it means to you and how you see the method of this text perhaps introducing new ways of constructing narrative or thinking about you know mashup as method <laughs> right the kinds of intimacies that it creates yeah, is it going to work it's not. Oh, it's back. Okay. Um, okay. That, that thanks for the question. Um, I yeah. I mean, I think one of the things reading the book, it's almost like at times you feel like you walk into one room and there's been a daft talking, and then you come out and you walk into the other and sort of the cover art, and it's a lovely experience of kind of going through text by text. But I think there's also something really productive about putting these texts alongside different texts for the first time, right? Because then when you read them alongside them, you do think about them differently, right? So many of the I don't think it's common to find an anthology with this range of texts together. So I think that narrative also produces. You can read them separately, right? You can just take that text, but actually reading them, there's something very productive about reading, thinking about them alongside another in that narrative form. And I think I felt, I mean, I haven't read all these essays before, but some of them I had read. And I think reading them, like you say, with the imagery um, in, this f in this different form, I did read them differently. Like you start to think about questions in new ways. And so I think there's something very productive about putting old famous essays alongside um, alternative um, forms in this way. And that I thought was, um, was really, really interesting. Um, and so again, I, I'd also like to hear about when you were doing this, th were you thinking about the reader in this? Were you were taking the reader on the narrative yourself a little bit, right? Choosing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and stuff. So I'd also be interested to know how this narrative question as well, about how you thought about the reader's experience in that sense. So. No, I, I just want to say, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, this, this whole idea of sort of disorientation with the use of language, of narratives, and so on, it's quite important. I mean, y y obviously, uh, as you say, you do, you're, not going to, you, you, you're not trying to introduce India to a Chinese audience with the translation, but then 
the Chinese reader, a Chinese reader would have to know a bit about India to actually get into the text and know the what what the the, the political vocab vocabulary is about. Dr. Alistair talked about you know, using it as, as t teaching material. Then, I mean the, the, that I mean that the, it's a very sort of steep learning curve for for even for 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 myself. I mean, if I don't have the background to a lot of things that's happening, then uh, I think what you know from what you, you did with the, the visuals and so on, it was very helpful in contextualizing this 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 new vocab political vocabularies. That as you said, e that, that even though even though the the, 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 the writers mostly wrote in English, is they use a language that is completely different, if quite alien to what we are used to, even in in Hong Kong. I mean. One one example I can bring up is I, I I'm not I'm sure we, a lot of us is work in, in academia or uh, public institutions. We always comes to these terms like stakeholders, and this is a completely depoliticization of what's going on inside a public institution or even within society. We are not stakeholders, right? I mean, you, we I have no stake in any of the whole. I, mean, I don't hold anything. So I, I I mean this is I think this is I think this will be a very refreshing for a, a a Chinese audience to not if they have as you said as as you did with the volume they have the the, the necessary background to get inside a political a, a particular political discourse that might be even uh, sort of fading in in India in two thousand twenty three. As a alternative sort of political discourse emerges. Uh, I just have a very quick response, um, but 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 uh, Barnes remind me as a student, you know, back in ten years ago, <laughs> when we do our essays on post-colonialism and our only knowledge about India or the only score. Uh, we cite in our essay usually Homi Baba uh, Speedway. And we can, you know, talk about you know subaltern and location of culture. Actually without reading the book, we just you know <laughs> cite those sources from, you know, the second you know, secondary uh, uh, sources and something like that. So this you know, we cannot differentiate which one is more famous, you know, the names or which one is more classical uh reading but uh but uh um uh, at the moment, I you know uh, uh, edit the book. Actually, I need to read through from the, the very beginning to the very end, and especially after um, I don't know whether it's very sensitive to mention 2019 protests, but after the protests, um, uh, when I do the book, you know, a lot of curious uh, pieces. You know, we talk about you know democracy, nationalism. And also protest strike, and also you know uh, uh, disagreement. Those kind of words you know appears in the protest and also in the book. So I can somehow associate you know although the experience very far away from us, but uh, uh, in, in in India, but somehow you know those discussion, interrogation, and also those you know you know the, the history you have gone through, your country have gone through. Can I can find some a lot of resonance and echo, you know, during the time when I read the book. It's okay, that's it. Thank you so much for your responses. Um, it's time for the Q and A. I've I've been told. So, uh, is there a mic that will uh, be passed around? So I think uh, w the um, so it's open to the audience now. If you have any questions, raise your hand, and I think we'll bring the mic over to you. Yes. I'm Ming Wong Huang from uh, Jindan University in India. Uh, actually, I have no going through the book, but I just wonder why you pick up the land, the title of the Hunger of the Republic. Uh, what is the reason for that? Yeah. Um, there was no single reason. Um, I think there are two things. I mean, one is, of course, that it's a it's a straight uh, uh, homage to an inversion of the famous essay called The Republic of Hunger, which is in the book, Utsa Patnaik's um, essay. 
Um, now, uh, what is very interesting, I've been talking about the people, you know, the, the, uh, this, the, there's a very specific kind of a shift that takes place, and this is what Veena Das talks about in that, you know. She says that, I mean, the, the, uh, I'll tell you the specific incident that happened there. The Bhopal, what happened is that when the Bhopal gas tragedy happened, uh, the government of India decided that it would be the sole entity that will speak for the people because it would be best positioned to argue for them, which was which is a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, that's what governments are supposed to do. They're supposed to represent the people. But when it spoke for the people in a way that stopped the people speaking for themselves, and then you had two very important Supreme Court cases, Charan Lal Sahu, was was one where the people said no sorry we will speak for ourselves we do not want you to speak for us you had a very interesting kind of a problem that arose which was then which would then become quite a complicated sort of um, problem problem later right now you have a situation and Partha Chatterjee in this famous book called I am the people right now that's published speaks of the idea of the people as an empty signifier that uh, you know the people are everywhere and nowhere because the people are constantly referred to as the people of India or the people of America or the people of whatever, Hong Kong, uh, saying that the people want this, the people want that, and except you don't know what the people are. You know, who is the people uh, and who speaks for the people was, is, a, is an increasing problem that's, that's kind of arising. Now, what does this have to do with hunger uh, is, is a question. I mean, back in the day uh, when Utsap Patnaik is speaking, actually speaking of hunger in relation to famine or... Uh, a particular kind of poverty that, that exists. But can there be another kind of idea of hunger as represented by a particular kind of an absence, right? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really something like that, you know, a kind of a, a discursive hollow uh, that, that exists, you know, which uh, in, inside the republic, that the republic is almost like a kind of a, a hollow space in which, you know, you, you, you sort of, Enter with concepts, but then can't kind kind of kind of exist. There was a, a specific technological kind of consequence to it as well, which has been quite an quite an important issue in India. Around uh, that's not something that the book specifically deals with, but the privacy, the the laws, the privacy laws that that we've had ever since uh, a very important Supreme Court judgment in 2018 concluded that privacy was a a natural right that all human beings possessed in the very nature, in the very fact that they exist, and it was not an, it was an inalienable right. You could not ever give away your privacy. Your pri privacy existed inside of you. But what it then does is that it leads to a certain bodily condition, you know, um, of the people, you know, uh, as actual sort of bodies. I mean, with uh, a corporeal existence. I mean, we'll have 10 finger, fingerprints and two iris scans, for example, that defines them as a certain kind of corporeal bodily subject that's, that's now there, which is, which is a very, very important new development because the technologies associated with, for example, reaching out to the people is often associated with the technological delivery of services to those particular people. So whether it's food or whether it's money or whether it is direct cash transfers, you're actually reaching out to the people on this particular kind of, kind of platform. Um, this also seemed to have something to do with, with hunger because, you know, things like, for that, that's de dealt with in this book, the, the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme that's, that's existing, which has had quite a, quite a battle around. I mean, so Jean Drez, very important social scientist, actually speaks of constitutional rights and defining the people and, and, and what has shifted in that particular category. I mean, it, just, it, was a, it was a metaphorical thing that said that hunger as a concept did deal with all these rather more complex concepts rather than merely the absence of food. You know, uh, it was a conceptual kind of hunger that, that we were trying to address, I mean, something like that. It's always, you know, when you have metaphorical titles and you have to give a rational explanation, it's always <laughs> hard, I guess. Hi, Asish. Um, thank you for, um, thank you, Enoch, for putting up this book, translating this book, and Ashish, uh, I think it is really, really nicely arranged. Um, uh, it's a really good gateway drug to India, I would say. <laughs> like, um, it immediately triggers a lot of curiosity. Well, you mentioned about uh, India as a methodology. So it means that, like, all these problems with, uh, for example, the rising of totalitarianism or the global um, right-wing rises, 
um, we could see, like we could um, somehow deduce some sort of solution or at least a basic understanding, even like here in Hong Kong or in other parts of Asia. Um, uh, my question is like, how do I, if I want to claim this methodology, if I want to claim this um, uh, Indian legacy, how do I not sound like appropriation? Like how do I genuinely utilize the resources of this book but n not s sounding like, you know, just um, speaking over the, the voices of, um, of the Indian people and use it elsewhere? No answer that, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I would say feel free, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I mean, uh, you, I mean, you know, in, 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 a, in a way, see, the point is that a lot of these concepts are truly public domain concepts. So they are, they are, they are susceptible to appropriation, misappropriation, and many other things. But then those concepts will survive or not survive. I mean, you know, I in other words, uh, you, you, you started something, hopefully, and as I'm saying, books have a resilience. Books do, do, do live. Uh, on, uh, especially I think in the in the in the new modes that we s that, that that we have, and along with them, those concepts will make whatever sense that they do make. I don't beyond this. I I I, I don't know. Enoch, would you like to come in on this? I mean, what what meaning eventually will be made, and how will it be? Uh, I mean, but I I don't think I'm the right person to answer your question <laughs> because they ask they're asking. About, but I think, you know, I think. You know, en encounter any um, historical, practical resources in anywhere of the world. I think we can use speedy, right? We can just appropriate. We 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 we, we don't need to seek approval <laughs> of, of 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 the origin or or, or somehow creative creatively to appropriate those resources as a strategic way. You know, for for us in Hong Kong or in anywhere of the, uh, of, of the world that can make use of those resources as, as a tactic, I would say, as a strategy to, to, to cope with our current situation. So I don't think we have a proper answer to her, his question, but, but to me, you know, uh, please, please pardon me that I will use, it, use your resources freely in Hong Kong <laughs> you know, to uh, equip us or equip me uh, to, to face the current situation. I want. Is it worth? Yeah. No, I want to make a comment on the book, but but since uh, that this uh, that question come up, it reminds me of of a Chinese um, book book of history in monasteries in in Hong Kong, and it's always had something in the back. It says, "You welcome the pirates so it's so that the, the message will spread," and uh, there's a little bit of that in your book. Um, but the most in, uh, what I get away from reading your book, especially when I try to. When when it starts to be captivating, and I in fact the second time I read it, I tried to read through the whole thing, at least flip through, um, uh, um, the book as coherent uh, uh, collection, not just as anthology of disparate essays, and it does have a sense um, of the urgency of the time and how the time is still with us today. Um, I think that is really the great value of, of this of these volumes. And in particular, reading this as a Chinaman, because there are a lot of these issues in the book, which um, which were the uh, normally issues that are brought up in the same language, but in fact they have totally different significances. Um, and reading the book, especially in this anthology, um, firstly it makes me feel that I'm in the thick of an Indian intellectual conversation. Uh, I can't catch up because I can't even cut into it. Uh, the 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 ideas are thrown at me so so rapidly, one after the other. And um, it throws me into a time, into a discussion, into argument, into dis discourse. But uh, there are certain issues in there which is fascinating from, from the viewpoint of somebody um, dipping into 
in this dialogue for, from Hong Kong or from China, <coughs> especially issues about the state. There are so many discussions about questioning or rethinking the state. And uh, this is something you will not find um, in, in China so often because it is almost something that is not questioned. Um, but of course, it is questioned as, um, as a problem of modernity, as a critic of modernity of, of, of the nation state. And that as one of the features one, one needs to tackle to, to, to outgrow this problem we are all facing today. But um, uh, the example of India is so much more interesting in that you are taking the assumption that there, there is no India uh, until we come into the modern era. Um, but from China, for us, the West Heavens was always one big thing out there. So in the outside imagination from further east, <laughs> India was not a state, but it was a civilizational realm. So in, in the book, you actually bring that up um, confirm certain uh, imaginations about India um, by bringing up these diverse myths which make people live together. But also these myths, in fact, do not all overlap. And there were these, um, th there were these different histories and different mythological memories being brought together and mashed into this whole um, big edifice today, enterprise today um, called India. And um, um, although there are arguments about how British colonialism had something to do with it. But uh, on the other hand, um, this is the modernization process of, of um, dealing with the West that has happened globally. But in India, in this case, um, it's different from the Chinese experience especially, in that in China, there's always assumption of a coherency or, or a civilizational coherency that is largely the, the, the dialogue between center and periphery uh, is quite clearly set. Of course, there were arguments even ages ago. Confucius was being laughed at by the hermits because he was arguing for the Zhou dynasty when in fact he is a descendant of the Shang dynasty. But this is a very long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, but in the example of these discourses in this book, we are in the argument of still discussing this idea of the state which I think is very, very healthy because we tend now not to um, critique the, the nation state um, in the same manner, um, but India still has this possibility. So it, what it means is that there's also the possibility of escaping it. Um, and another thing which, um, uh, which I found interesting was, of course, was what was um, what Brian just brought up about the name of the people. Naming, renaming the people um, is, a, is, a, uh, is almost like different ways of the regime of the people, of the control of the people, change, changing over time, changing this process of modernization. And although there's a lot of overlap between what's happened in, in China uh, from, from the different names that was brought up until uh, from the people, the masses, or the, or the national uh, person, Guokman, uh, the national citizens, all these th changing of a name, every time when the name is changed in the publics or the people is addressed, that means you get some new kind of rule over your head. Um, and um, and in, in the essays here, these arguments uh, about um, the naming of the people are made very specific uh, or with examples such as the famine, um, the the chemical disaster and how speaking on and for the people ch would change this um, possibility. So this is absolutely fascinating. Um, but I don't want to go on because I think everybody should read this book. It's an is absolute gem and uh, is a long book um, by the weight of it. But once you get into it, 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 it sails. So thank you very much, Ashish. Thank, thank you so much for the comments. Uh, in the interest of time, I will take one more question and then, you know, E either you or the panelists can respond to what was uh, said and also answer the next question. We have uh, time for one more question. Actually, I've been staring at this uh, keyword in the glossary, uh, in the key keyword section, um, Dali, if I pronounce it correctly. 
sell it, right? So uh, Brian has been talking about uh, the different names of people uh, uh, in Chinese, and I, I was wondering, uh, now we talk about uh, the Indian uh, uh, experience, that uh, maybe uh, Indian experience as a method that maybe China can borrow or uh, learn from or appropriate. Uh, I'm I would very much like to know how wide is the currency of this term Dalit in the uh, in intellectual discourse of English, uh, uh, Indian Indian intellectuals, Indian Indian uh, daily dialogues, uh, intellectual uh, dialogues, discussions, because as I as far as I noticed that all the essays of uh, in this collection are using uh, the term Dalit instead of people, as in in English. Dalit is a is a is a is a Sanskrit name that uh, uh, that is borrowed to refer to people. You know, uh, this is my un misunderstanding uh, because I'm reading through translation. So I was looking at this uh, entry and I was thinking about uh, how how this vocabulary, how this glossary, this term has become a very key term that I am trying to compare with the Chinese concept of people. So that's my misunderstanding. So uh, I, I'm, I would be very curious to know that uh, how wide is the currency of this term in India? No, I, I th 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 here we are really at uh, at I suppose the crux of the translation question, and I have no personal uh, uh, control over idea of uh, how this word has either been translated or what meaning has been made of it. Uh, so you know, Enoch may <laughs> or whoever's trans I don't know. Uh, that's 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 uh, some some some. Um, no, Dalit is uh, uh, the, the the concept of I mean basically the caste situation in India. As a as one of the foundations of both modernity and democracy, go back to Gandhi, go back to Ambedkar, you know, go back to the founding principles of the Indian Indian Constitution. Uh, you know, it is it is written into that particular constitutional structure that the directive principles, which is part four of the call. So I, I'll just give you a quick little thing about that. What happened was that normally uh, a constitution and of a new nation state will be to talk about what the rights of the people are yeah uh, so there's a whole sort of part part two part one part two this thing about fun fundamental rights of the people and so on but one of the explicit contributions of the constitution of india that goes back to this particular person called ambedkar who um, you know was considered to be one of the one of the you know the uh, you know uh, what can you say the intellectual uh, the defining intellectual presences for the constitution was something known as the directive principles yeah the dpsp the directive principles of state policy which speaks about the role of the state to the people it speaks about what the responsibility of the state is to the people not the people's right in both these, there was a very explicit understanding that there was a certain kind of a condition of caste oppression which required the state to recognize and, and put into its constitutional framework that these particular sets of, you know, what uh, I think comes with the schedule, the schedule eight, I think, of the constitution that defines a set of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, which are along with other specific oppressed entities, the, uh, the kinds of people who needed state support. So uh, caste in this sense is central to the conceptualizing of the modern governance mechanism. Um, since then, of course, caste uh, and Dalit, uh, so there's a specific use, basically Gandhi used a very different word for the lower caste, called it Harijan, which is c considered politically incorrect for complex reasons, which you may be able to tell us more about. Um, you know, it, it goes back to, to, to long histories, but Dalit is a term that uh, that that is that is now uh, accepted as the as the term with, the, with which you use for the lower caste. That is to say, the 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 people who are the the low low caste. Uh, now this in turn will further you know for example when we had a certain economic uh, segregation of the of the people by by income you know we had uh, you want to come in on this. Uh, it, it, it's a can of worms, quite a complicated story. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, we, we'll, we'll really leave it at that because I think that it's, it's really quite a, quite a complicated issue. Now, I don't, I, I know, I'd be interested to know how that w con the word has been translated and what meaning has been made here because it certainly would 
open up, I think, a, a new a new question. Uh, and would you like to? Hello, hello. I think in Chinese it should be in Chinese in. Oh. Okay, okay. Okay. So you translate in Dai Zhong, right? In Da Zhong. So in the masses, it it translate back into English from Chinese to <laughs> English is I think it's right, the masses, right? If it translate into back into English, right? I, I just wanted to, uh, do we have a time just for one co comment or, yeah? Do you want to, yeah, I just, because I know that you were having a, in case you wanted to. Very quick question. My, my name is Bill Mack. I work on historical Sino-Indian uh, relation. And uh, I really appreciate the, the, the discussion today. Um, my question, a uh, very quick one, I is the, um, Ashish mentioned that this book, the, the topics chosen are, are contentious, even for Indian readers. And then Brian mentioned that the, the topic uh, is a, a steep learning curve for the Chinese audience. So um, while I personally, I would definitely read the book. I, I don't know which version I would read first, the English or Chinese, but I, I, I wonder um, how you wish to uh, engage with the Chinese readers uh, with this book, or, or how do you Ambition the dialogue to continue. No, no idea. Um, I I mean we we have to now see because to my understanding I don't know whether this is right or wrong. I mean uh, I know West Heavens. I mean uh, Johnson, for example, uh, has been had been over the years talking about the history of Indian interactions with China and uh, even the failures. I mean, one of the great moments was really, and you, Brian has written about it as well, uh, the Tagore's, the famous Tagore uh, story of, of how he arrived in China at that point of time. And there were issues and questions at that particular time. Now, um, I think that, I, I mean, I, I, I think that first of all, uh, uh, you know, this is not going to be an unproblematic uh, journey. Uh, it could be a journey that in the extreme case ends in some absolute failure and you say, well, what kind of an anomaly of a book was this? Um, but at the same time, I think as the book now, starting today with the public launch of it, uh, launches into its own public career, uh, I would be very interested as a bystander, really, more than an active participant in, in seeing what meaning is made, uh, how, how, it, how it goes. Um, so I have no real idea actually as to whether maybe I don't even know if I have a role to play other than just as a bystander in what now happens because my ideal hope is that this particular book enters Chinese public debate or you know uh, that that you know it becomes a kind of a point of reference because it exists in your language uh, so you know you will make what meaning you you make I mean re you the readers if you like of it will make what meaning you make. And then I can't, I mean, I can't say any more than this uh, with anyone else. Uh, I, think, I think Heidi's, um, you know, go back to your comments, you know, I think the, the, the as simple as study already illustrate, you know, our, our, our glimpse of what we can admit <laughs> in the future, you know, you know how um, you know, Chinese media receive the book and then make use of it. So because of, of translation, I don't think we have a perfect translation for that, that this work because, you know, we yeah, yeah. And then, but, but we read through language. So we receive the concept through language and through Chinese. And Chinese cannot have a perfect equivalent for this work. So we can only use words like the masses to understand so it already shifts the meaning, right? You know, through translation, through circulation, <laughs> through our readings of the word. And then we can put the masses and all the articulation around Dali, this word, into our context. Into Taiwan, into Hong Kong, into mainland China. We don't know, we don't know what happened. But uh, let's see, I don't know. 
Thank you to the audience for all their wonderful questions. Uh, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, I wish the book and all the translations, <laughs> present and future, uh, all the very best. Yes, thank you.